Today's reading is from Romans chapter 8, verses 12 to 17, and I'll be reading from the New International Version. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh, to the love according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit that you received does not make you slaves, so that you will live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to the sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. This is the word of the Lord. You may recall a story I told a few years ago, or probably not, because I can't even remember what I had for lunch a couple days ago. So whether you remember a story I told a couple years ago is probably not relevant or true. If you remember it, just nod along like it's the first time, all right? In any case, it's, it's a story about my, my family's identity. I mean, I obviously have a fairly distinct surname, uh, if you haven't noticed already, uh, here in Metro Vancouver, if you find any other Grochowskis, they're probably related to me, all right? There aren't very many of us in Metro Vancouver, that's for sure. And that played against me when I entered into high school. Uh, I have two older brothers, and so when I attended that first class in grade eight, and the teacher was taking attendance, and they came upon my name, they said, ah... So you're a little Grochowski. It terrified me. Absolutely terrified me. Here's why. As I said, I have two older brothers, both of whom had very different reputations. One was a bit of a rebel and got into trouble a lot. The other was really smart and basically a straight A student. So when this teacher identified me as a little Grochowski, what was he projecting as my anticipated identity? Which reputation was he expecting me to live up to? Now, thankfully, I was able to carve out my own entirely different reputation uh, as I went through high school, better or for worse. Um, but it reminded me, that experience reminded me that I am part of something bigger, something special, something immeasurably more than just myself. There is a family heritage and an identity uh, that is associated with the name. But it also reminded me, that experience reminded me that my identity is not based on what others might project upon me or expect of me, but in who I am genuinely as a human being. Now, who I am dramatically changed soon after I graduated from high school when I came to faith in Jesus. And now I really am part of something bigger, something special, something immeasurably more than just myself. Because I, I have a, a new name, a new identity as a member in the family of God. An identity that is shaped by the gospel of Jesus Christ. We explored some of that uh, identity last Sunday as we looked at uh, the purpose of the gospel, that we are um, disciples of Jesus who make more disciples, uh, and that's part of our identity. 
Uh, that we are to live gospel-shaped lives, filling uh, all things with the glory of God, filling the world with Jesus. And as disciples who make disciples, as people who are moving from unbelief to belief, we are being recreated into a fuller, richer, deeper representation of the image of God. I think that, and I just can't help but say, wow. This morning, I want to dig a little deeper into that, focusing on our gospel identity. Specifically, uh, we're going to focus in on one aspect of it that I hope will have a, a deeply profound impact on all of us as a church. Remember, the Bible teaches, and we know this, we, we repeat this often, that we, when we come to faith in Christ, if we are in Christ, we are a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Uh, the Bible also teaches that we are adopted into the family of God, where we serve on mission with God and others in this world as disciples who make disciples sent into the world. That's who we are. That's our gospel identity. Moments ago, I said, I, who I am dramatically changed after high school because that was when I came to faith in Christ. And through Jesus, I entered into a, a relationship with God as our Father, a relationship that was renewed and restored and made possible by the sacrifice, the grace, and the mercy of Jesus and continues to take place because of the presence, the powerful presence of the Holy Spirit. I'm now part of this new family, both eternally and right now. Being reborn, renewed, restored. God is shaping me and recreating me more and more into his image daily. And the same goes for you as well. There is far too much rhetoric in this world that says we cannot or should not change who we are. I disagree, and I, so does God, by the way. See, that's the thing about coming to faith in Jesus. As I said, he draws us into relationship with, with our Heavenly Father. He does, but he does not desire to leave us the way we were when it happened, but rather wants to recreate us into his image. Charles Spurgeon once said, since the Lord made me, he can put me right and keep me so to the end. Change can and does happen in relationship with Jesus, and that's a good thing. And we have the presence of the Holy Spirit's. And, and we are immersed into a family of faith, as messy as the family of faith often is, to help us with the transformation and ensure it continues to take place. So, what does this have to do with our gospel identity? Everything. Our passage in Romans 8, beginning of verse 12, un unpacks it a little bit for us. It's one of a number of places we could have looked at this morning on this topic. But here, I wanted to start here, and I wanted to start at verse 12 as well, because it opens up as, with a reminder of our debt or our obligation. We often think of debt solely probably in our, our culture and in our time. We think about uh, the numerical value of your, your bank account, right? We think of debt. If it's in the negative, you've got debt, right? That sort of thing. We owe someone money. But the word debt also just speaks of perhaps an obligation we have when we are bound by duty, like in a covenant agreement. So here, the debt is not the debt of sin or a debt to the flesh, but to the leading of the Holy Spirit. A debt, an obligation to follow where he leads. Uh, N.T. Wright uh, points out that this passage here, this portion especially of Romans 8, echoes uh, Old Testament passages and imagery uh, of the people of Israel during their exodus from Egypt. There they were led by God himself, a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And though he was with them, they messed up all the time, often gratifying the desires of the flesh and failing to follow where God leads. Rather than saying no to those temptations and continuing to enjoy his presence and blessing, they became slaves to the flesh. 
And here we have similar overtones and warnings. But instead of a pillar of cloud or a pillar of fire, we have the the, the promise of the Spirit, the personal presence of the living God, the one whom we follow. And not just the personal presence of the living God for our own sake, but as a member of the family of God. And verses 14 to 7 reminds us this. It, it calls us children of God. It refers to us as being adopted into God's family speaks of this privilege that we have to be able to call God Abba, Father. And not just children, and not just heirs, but co-heirs with Jesus. And that's some pretty amazing, powerful stuff. This is our gospel identity. We are part of God's great family. We are in relationship with Him. God himself, through Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we need to follow him and not our, our unbridled passions, lusts, or temptations. Verse 14 reminds us this, where it says, For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The idea of being led by the Spirit, is it's, it's in our vernacular. We hear people talk about being led by the Spirit all the time. And sometimes we're, we think of it as, you know, those moments where we say, well, I, I felt led to speak to that person and encourage them about Jesus, or I felt led to help this person, or I felt led to go into ministry. Um, but that's not what this means here in verse 14, those who are led by the Spirit. This, uh, Doug Moo in his commentary, I think, it describes it Wonderfully, he says, it means having the basic orientation of your life determined by the Spirit. In other words, knowing where you are and the direction you're heading in, and if you're ever straying from the path, the Spirit can bring you back. The Spirit, uh, as a, in a sense, becomes our true north. If you're thinking of like a compass and trying to find your way in and through the wilderness. Elsewhere, Paul writes about this differently. He talks about walking with the Spirit, of keeping in step with the Spirit, of not grieving the Spirit. All phrases that remind us that when we run ahead or take a different path or grieve the Spirit, then our lives are not oriented correctly. Yes, sometimes we as his children stray, just as our own children do. But God's desire is for us to return to him and allow his spirit to lead. As I said, in a sense, like true north, orienting us and guiding us in a direction, in a path. And because we follow the spirit or have that basic orientation of life determined by the spirit, then we're no longer slaves to fear. Verse 15 says that. Again, bringing up images uh, of Israel's time in captivity is right and many others suggest. But as those adopted into the family of God, as verse 15 says, we are set free from the bondage uh, uh, and fear. Christ has freed us from slavery to the law and slavery to the sin that the law fails to prevent, as one commentator says. And this is the case because, as I said, we've been adopted into the family of God. Adoption, by the way, it does not make you a second-class family member. Fear and misunderstanding of adoption may cause us to think that way, but, but I want to correct that. When we're adopted, we have full rights. Personal example, because we get it as, as a family. When we adopted our son, there was a lot of paperwork and legal stuff that took place in a short period of time. Uh, while overseas, a magistrate not only declared him to legally be our son and authorize the adoption, but when that took place, his birth certificate was actually changed to our surname and not the given name that he was born with. And so he becomes a full member of our family. And then we went through the process of citizenship while out of country so that when he landed on Canadian soil, he landed as a Canadian and not a landed immigrant. So he is fully our son with the full rights and responsibilities of sonship and the full rights and responsibilities as a Canadian citizen. 
Not as a second class member of the family or in society or, or in some way uh, that we sometimes think, but fully right. That's the picture of the adoption of all of us into God's great family as well. Given, in a sense, a new name and given the full rights as sons and daughters of God. Now, when I think of our family and the adoption part, I realize we're uh, imperfect parents of a dysfunctional, blended, biracial family. And then I think about that and I think in a lot of ways, you know, that's a great representation of the family of God. With one exception, our Heavenly Father is perfect. But the family, yeah, it's a bit quirky. It's a bit messy. It's from all over the world. And that's part of the beauty of our gospel identity as well. We're not alone. We're part of this great, big, beautiful, messy family. It's so important for us. Uh, I was talking with Tom before we started the service. We were talking about just the being able to get back together in person. And, and, and this, this is part of it. As family, we need to get together to be with one another, to worship side by side, to fellowship with one another, to um, just journey this life of, of faith together, not as, as individuals on our own somewhere. So important. Uh, let me get back to the father imagery. I, I, I want to address this because briefly, because I know it's hard for some. I know some never had a, a father figure or a, or a good father figure in, in life. And if that's you, I, I pray that you find peace and you find your way forward. But don't let that impact and, and, and cause you to miss the beauty of our Heavenly Father's way as Father. He is, as this passage says, Abba, Father. Now, many people take that word Abba to mean uh, something more casual, more intimate, like Papa or Daddy, uh, just like we might address our own earthly fathers. And there's good reason to think that. It's an intimate word, for this new intimate relationship that people have with God. But I also think we need to see that word in another light. Because uh, the Aramaic word, it's, it's, it's one, of the, one of those Aramaic words that's inserted into the, the Greek original that gets just transliterated uh, for our sake. That word can also simply mean the Father. Again, an emphasis on his glory as the one and only God, taking us back to the Exodus account where he says, you shall have no other gods before me. I will be your God. You will be my people. That kind of father imagery. I think a, a, a careful balance of the intimacy that we have with him and the reverence that we should have for our Heavenly Father. Kind of like in the Lord's Prayer, when we pray, Our Father, that's an intimate expression. But then we follow that right up with, which art in heaven. There's a reverence, an understanding of the relationship. It's both and. Use it, uh, we, use it wisely. We keep, but, but remember, we're privileged to be able to call him Abba, Father. And he has made us heirs. And not just heirs, but co-heirs with Christ. As, as children of God, we have this marvelous inheritance. This wonderful inheritance that is ours because of our position in God's family. When you're an heir, your inheritance is not, there we go, thanks, Jimmy. <laughs> when you're an heir, your inheritance is not earned by something you do. It's a matter of relationship, right? Too often, though, when it comes to our faith and we think of the inheritance, we think too much like the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler, remember, he came, comes to Jesus and says, what must I do? do to inherit eternal life. 
Now that rich young ruler was a moral, respectable, clean living and law abiding person, but had no sense of the eternal inheritance to look forward to because he wasn't in the family. He needed to be born again, come to faith in Jesus. Jesus gives him that strong, one thing you lack, sell all you have, give it to the poor, then come follow me. In other words, you, you're, you're this great person and you think you, you, you just need to do something to get your inheritance. So here's what you can do. You can do this, get rid of this, because this is the God that you have. You shall have no other gods before me, the scripture says. In a sense, his question really was a contradiction in terms. As an heir, your inheritance is yours because of relationship, not based on what you do. Peter described it as an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade away, reserved or kept in heaven for you. Uh, Richard Strauss writes, he says, one day we will have a glorious new body, a glorious new home, and a glorious new existence in God's glorious heaven. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Now, a joint heir is someone you simply share the inheritance with. If you inherit your parents' estate, uh, you are an heir. If you have brothers or sisters who also get a share in that estate, then you are a joint heir. That's the imagery here. Because of that, it applies to uh, Paul applies. It. He says we're joint heirs with Christ. So all that belongs to Him by virtue of His His eternal relationship with the Father, we get to share. Again, wow. Sit with that for a moment. Let me repeat it and, and just think about that. All that belongs to Jesus by virtue of His eternal relationship with the Father, we're joint heirs. We get to share. We're joint heirs with Christ. Our gospel identity is not connected to our stuff, our job, our past, our or what or anything that we do. We are who we are because of Jesus. We've been adopted into and get to be can get to be part of this great big. Sometimes messy, but one day perfect family of faith. God has always desired a people, a family, who would live in such a way that the world would see and know what he is truly like. We've talked about this as part of the process of understanding the gospel in a deeper way and being gospel, gospel fluency. We've talked about you know, being the image of God and being fruitful and multiplying isn't just about procreating and having children, but it's about multiplying the image of God in this world. Uh, and he, he chose Israel to be that uh, example. He walked with them, provided for their needs, showed them his love and protection, sent them out to do the same with and for others. But they rejected God and chose to live otherwise, treating other nations as outsiders, separating themselves, those kinds of things. Rather than being people that reflected the image of God, it seemed as you read through the scriptures that they're more interested or focused on their own priorities than on God's glory. God has always desired a people who would live in such a way that the world would see and know what he is truly like. And we as the church, God's family, we are his plan for loving the world in this way. We ourselves have been so radically and sacrificially loved as children that it is our privilege to proactively, generously care for the needs of one another, both physically and spiritually, regardless of background, ethnicity, status, or whatever else the world will use to divide. That may sound like a heavy load, but it isn't. The life we now live as God's family is not a burden. It's a privilege. As Caesar Kalinowski likes this to say, it is not that we have to live this way. It's that we get to live this way. He, he writes this. He says, sharing life together centered on the gospel is the closest thing 
this side of heaven to walking with Jesus in the flesh. And as we do, we show the world the heart of our heavenly father, the one we get to call Abba. What a privilege to be part of God's family. That is our gospel identity. Now, remember, ultimately, it's not the things we do that make us a family. It's God who determines that. God calls us to himself. He makes us a family. Yes, as I said, we're sometimes dysfunctional, sometimes messy, because we're still moving from unbelief to belief. And Jesus is continuing to recreate us into his image. And besides, every family has that weird uncle or shy cousin or sibling with a rebellious reputation, sibling with a really smart, brainy, straight-A reputation, neither of whom are necessarily you. You are uniquely who Christ is shaping into his image as part of God's family, which is made up of incredible diversity. Indeed, the most diverse group of people anywhere in the world. Even here, many nations, two congregations, one church, Broadmoor. And as a family at Broadmoor, what matters most is not It's not necessarily, you know, the stuff we do, although that becomes a natural outflow of who we are. What matters is the stuff we do, surely care about. The way we display his image. The way we participate together, partner with one another and with the Holy Spirit because we get to. Because of who we are together and how we treat one another and, 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 and all people who are not part of the family of faith. See, being part of the family means that we, we ourselves have seen and experienced the kind of love and grace and mercy Jesus has shown, and we have received it. And, and then we also need to show it unconditionally to all without any prejudice or any hindrance at all. The things we choose to do out of love and deference to one another are what binds us together and creates family. So my brothers and sisters, Look around the room this morning. Look, go ahead. Look around. These are your brothers and sisters. Great family of faith. All kinds of people from all kinds of backgrounds, all kinds of experiences, all seeking to be shaped and reshaped and recreated into, into Christ's image. God's in the adoption business. Let's not worry or try to focus on trying to figure out who's in and who's out of that family. And just, and just treat everyone as family. After all, if you can call the likes of someone like you or me, you can call anyone to be part of the same family. We have a new identity. It's our gospel identity. We are shaped by it. And we are adopted into this wider family of faith that treats others with the same love grace, and mercy we've received. Learn it. Love it. Live it. Let's pray. Thank you for this great calling to which you have called us. We are not called to live isolated lives. We are called into your family called to be your sons and daughters. And we just simply pray, Lord, that you would remind us of that today and remind us to look around and see our brothers and sisters and see that we're not alone in our experiences and in our journey. But there are many who travel this path. And may it also cause us to have eyes to see the world around us differently and with your love and grace and compassion. We thank you that in a few moments' time, we will get the opportunity and privilege to participate around the table because that's what family does. Thank you for inviting us to the table and making it possible by the great sacrifice of Jesus Christ. 
is in whose name we pray all these things. Amen.